pleasure at this time to introduce to you the names of the nine gentlemen who will join our present group of astronauts in preparing for flights in spacecraft programs which will follow Mercury. Bob Gilruth, director of the Manned Spacecraft are, Center. Mr. Neil A. Armstrong, Air Force Major Frank Borman, Navy Lieutenant Charles Conrad, Jr., Navy Lieutenant Commander James A. Lovell, Air Force Captain James A. McDivitt, Mr. Elliot M. C., Jr., Air Force Captain Thomas B. Stafford, Air Force Captain Edward H. White II, and Navy Lieutenant Commander John W. Young. The new astronauts are all test pilots, like the original seven, but with more engineering background. Also, they're a little taller, a little heavier, a little younger, and mysteriously, a little balder. Throughout the year 1964, the nation awaits the start of Project Gemini, the two-man flights which will constitute the second stage of our march to the moon. We wait to hear the magical words that tell us Gemini is launched. It will be 22 months before the clock starts. Nevertheless, behind the scenes, Gemini pushes ahead, while the public's attention turns to other sights and sounds. As a big-talking young man who is a bad poet and an unproven fighter, Cassius Clay takes the world heavyweight boxing crown from Sonny Liston exactly as he promised. And another big talk. Chairman Nikita Khrushchev is suddenly silenced by his comrades and sent to the sticks for displaying too much personality. While our astronauts remain earthbound, we fire cameras at the moon aboard Ranger 7 that send back 4,000 superb photos before crashing there. Suddenly, on October 12, 1964, Columbus Day, dedicated to the discoverer of America, Radio Moscow steals our thunder. We learn that Russia, while we're still training for two man flights, has orbited a team of three aboard a new model spacecraft called Voskhod, meaning sunrise. Captain Charles A. Bassett from Dayton, Ohio. Lieutenant Roger B. Chaffee, U.S. Navy, hometown Grand Rapids, Michigan, presently stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. Captain Ted Freeman of the Air Force, stationed at Edwards Air Force Base, hometown Lewis, Delaware. Captain C.C. C. Williams, uh, United States Marine Corps, uh, stationed at Quantico, Virginia. Hometown, Mobile, we have now had a third astronaut team in training for a year. Of the 16, these four will die before the first manned Apollo flight. In Vietnam, a mission of a few hundred advisors is becoming a U.S. Army of 22,000. The word escalation is now heard more often than space. We go into the new year, 1965, with a box of instruments called Mariner 4, well along on an eight-month journey to the planet Mars. President Johnson remarks in his inaugural address on January 20th, Think of our world as it looks from that rocket that's heading toward Mars. It is like a child's globe hanging in space. The continent stuck to its side like colored maps. We are all fellow passengers on a dot of Earth. And each of us, in the span of time, has really only a moment among our companions. In preparation for Gemini, a new spacecraft, bell-shaped like Mercury, but about half again larger, has been rigorously tested in two unmanned flights. McDonnell Aircraft, its builder, 
says it contains an estimated 1,230,000 parts, down to the last rate. For the booster, we've man-rated an advanced and well-proven version of Titan, the Air Force's intercontinental missile, with half again the thrust of Atlas. We have named and are training the team for the first manned Gemini flight. Veteran Gus Grissom will be command pilot. A new appointee will be his co-pilot. Navy Lieutenant Commander John W. Young. It's a wonderful opportunity to be able to make a significant contribution to the United States, to research and development, and I believe in the long run to the human race as a whole. I couldn't turn down a challenge like that. The world is duly informed that cigar-smoking John Young was born in San Francisco, educated in the South, has green eyes, draws cartoons for a hobby. He appears reserved, that is, down on Earth. In space, he will eventually show he dearly loves a caper. March 23rd is set for our first manned Gemini flight. On Pad 19, a new launch site in the sands of the Cape, men and machines labor to erect the new firecracker built by the Martin Company. Gus Grissom, mindful of the capsule that drowned on his Mercury flight, has named the new one Molly Brown for the unsinkable lady of that name. But again, the front runner in the race turns around again to give us the Slavic sneer. This is Radio Moscow. Five days before the scheduled Gemini launch, a pair of Russians are launched in Voskhod too and rack up some new firsts. Colonel Alexei Leonov leaves the cabin to walk 10 minutes in space. The following evening, the new vice president, Hubert Humphrey, chairman of the National Aeronautics and Space Council, declares, This week's news from the Soviet Union should emphasize what we've already known all too well. Now, we know that outer space which we hope and pray will be a peaceful laboratory, could provide the arena for what Winston Churchill once called the Wizard War. And if we're not strong enough in that so-called Wizard War, we are doomed. Each time that we pause, we have had shock from Soviet efforts in space, <laughs> from Sputnik in 1958 to the man in the spacesuit of yesterday. Ten, nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Bolton left off. That's your clock has started. You're on your way, Molly Brown. Yeah, we But now, finally, with a Titan's roar, we shoot our first two man team into space. Against the pilot's wishes, but as planned, Gemini Titan III, or GT-3, is held to three modest orbits. But Grissom and Young rack up new achievements in qualifying the hardware. Never simply passengers, they fly the spacecraft like a plane. They ship from one orbit to another by starting up, or as they call it, burning their engines, swooping as low as 52 miles above the Earth. The burn was a minute and 14 seconds of our watches. Such maneuvers must all be mastered if man is to steer himself to the moon. There's just one major departure from the preset flight plan. Thinly sliced corned beef on rye bread, which a congressman would later attack as a $30 million sandwich. Wally Shira tells the story. And that was prepared uh, the night before the flight, and then I took that to crew quarters and kept it in the refrigerator and gave it to John that evening, and we kept it chilled so there was no chance of it spoiling. And we've been eating these, I might add, regularly for months before this flight. And there were no dietetic problems that we could detect. So it was rather facetious the way the world made a big argument about it and embarrassed John Young and attempted to embarrass me too, I suppose. But after all, uh, just because we hadn't put on a spacesuit doesn't mean we had to stop eating normal food. We'd never last if we didn't have these little breaks in the routine. John Young, still smarting from the criticism that followed. No, it really wasn't for fun. It was for to take a guy's mind off his work when he was really busy and in, in some kind of a, a difficult situation. That's what I used it for, and that's what it was for. Ten weeks later, June 3rd, 1965, we take another two-man sprint in space that cuts down Russia's lead considerably. GT-4. Liftoff. Control of this flight after liftoff and all subsequent flights 
comes from the new Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas. James A. McDivitt. Flying to him was no boyhood passion. He came to it late, yet managed to win nine medals flying 145 combat missions in Korea. Edward H. White II. Tall and thin, Ed White has the stern glance of a medieval saint and the bubbling spirits of a kid with a new bike. On the third revolution, tethered by a golden umbilical cord, carrying a propulsion gun in hand, Ed White eases his lean bones out through a hatch and plunges into space. Okay, I'm out. Okay, get out. Get the For 22 no, glorious no, minutes, Ed White walks in space, doubling cosmonaut Leonov's stroll 11 weeks ago. The jet nozzle gun with which he maneuvers is itself an application of Newton's third law. Each time he fires it in one direction, he is gently nudged in the opposite direction. Okay, I rolled up and I'm rolling to the right now. Under my own influence, here goes a... Looks like a thermal glove, Jim. It is, it. Ah. Now I've come about the space draft. I'm coming back down now. I'm under my own control. Oh, there you are. Look at the camera on now. Okay. You're right in front, Ed. You look beautiful. I feel like a million dollars. I'm going to pick up. Like the moon, he has himself become a satellite of the Earth as he orbits at a slow 17,500 miles an hour, while the Earth and all of us are circling the sun at almost 67,000 miles per hour. His talks with Jim McDivitt inside the spacecraft show no concern. Yeah, problem, it's very easy to maneuver with the gun. The only problem I have is I haven't got enough fuel. This is the greatest experience I've A tragic experience awaits him 19 months from now. Ed White who is romping so joyously in space, will die on the ground, imprisoned in a flaming Apollo cabin. Just now, with tragedy still far over the horizon, White and McDivitt rack up 62 revolutions, 1,600,000 miles. For the next man Gemini flight, Gordo Cooper is teamed with a slim, slight bundle of brains and fun known to his friends as Pete Conrad. He barely missed appointment as one of the original seven. Two trademarks identify him at once to the public. The space like a dash between his front teeth and the fact that he is one of the few Princeton men to be tattooed. And when I came in the ready room, uh, everybody knew that I'd been trying for the program, you know, and they said, you had a person-to-person -person long distance phone call from Houston, you know, and I said, uh, yeah, sure, Charlie. And sure enough, it was Deke, and he, he asked me if I wanted to come fly for NASA. So, of course, I was, I was so excited I didn't know what to do. I almost wrecked myself driving home in the car. Such is now our ability to survive in space that Cooper and Conrad are scheduled for an eight-day, 121-orbit flight. But in Los Angeles, a week of rioting, shooting, and looting in a Negro ghetto called Watts indicates how poorly we manage on Earth. The American sky is still hazed with smoke from the fires of Watts on August 21st, 1965. Gemini 5, have a nice trip, drive carefully. Yes, have a nice trip and drive carefully. The preparations for the launch of flight GT5 have gone so well that there's not one single second of flight day launch hold. Gemini 5, this is Houston. We'd like to have you check your fuel cell. O2, H2, heater, circuit breaker, please. A main purpose of this flight is to test the highly sophisticated fuel cells, a device that replaces conventional batteries and generates electrical power by mixing oxygen and hydrogen at very low temperatures, also providing good drinking water as a byproduct. But after only a few hours on the sixth orbit, Oxygen pressure starts falling slowly in one of the two fuel cells. This threatens to reduce electrical power to the danger point. Arrangements are made for an emergency recovery. Gemini 5, Houston again. Uh, be advised that we've launched the aircraft into the four recovery area around Hawaii. Uh, we hope we don't have to use them, but it'll be a good exercise. And if we do need them, they'll be there for you. The flight continues. Though Gordo and Pete are told to power down their equipment, to hoard their electrical supply. Question, 
should Chris Kraft follow the mission rules and terminate the flight at only the sixth of the planned 121 orbits. He briefs Conrad on the situation. Looks like we got a situation here that's stabilized, Pete. Um, we've been discussing there was a case that if we'd gone exactly by the written word, we'd have ended the flight, whereas we were able to milk the thing. Now, we, we had to main our, maintain ourselves in a position of, can we safely carry on? And we said, now, look, we got enough battery power to last us 13 to 15 hours, even if, even if the fuel cells completely quit. And we've got a recovery situation that allows us to recover every orbit if we get into a problem. So let's give it a whirl and let's press on as long as we can. Okay, what do you think? As Pete remembers, okay, we'll look at this thing for another there's no man that I've ever run into who isn't more behind the crew and will do everything in his power to keep him airborne as long as it's safe and as long as we were willing to go by making that kind of a decision that allowed us to get the eight days. Their nerves couldn't be steadier as they push ahead with a number of scheduled experiments. They shoot a mass of color photos of Earth landmarks for the future Apollo flights. Okay, uh, Dr. Perry, I'd like to talk to you here for a couple of minutes. Oh, Gordo and Pete, you've had uh, 100 hours, 11 They assist in extensive space-to-Earth medical examinations of themselves to test the physical effects of long-duration flight. In moments of relaxation, they break into song. Gordo composed this yesterday after our system uh, pooped out on us. And you can sing it to, uh, we were sailing along, it goes like this. We were drifting along by the CSQ, when the radio suddenly said, here's word for you. Your controls are dead, but you're not through. So here we are for three days more with the end quite far. Hey, Pete, Pete, you're doing great till the last line. <laughs> Re recompose that, way. We'll work on it. We have a few more that are better. But... On the seventh day, another kind of crisis occurs as Gordo and Pete prepare a lunch of shrimp contained in a squeeze bag. Yeah, that's shrimp was the thickest of all the stuff that you mixed up and tried to squeeze out it too. And I was really squeezing down on that bag and it blew out on Gordo's side and there was shrimp was floating all over everywhere. And it, now it's really little shrimp, you know, these little tiny... Little teensy, yeah, shrimp. Sure. And uh, they'd stick on the instruments and uh, get them on the suit and, uh, you know, it just took a long time snatching them out of the air. <laughs> 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 cleaning it up and uh, I was very mad that we got the, any dirt on our flight suits or any junk in the spacecraft because we've been that's all we had to do for seven days anyhow was store garbage <laughs> <laughs> so it goes for eight days and nights three round-the-clock teams of flight controllers sharing Gemini control and two men sharing a home about the size of a compact car working there clowning there sleeping there finally they land wearing the beards that have become a trademark of the long Gemini flights. In the South Atlantic, they're taken aboard the carrier Lake Champlain, where an admirer calls by radio telephone from the LBJ ranch. Salute you both for the very calm and cool courage that you have shown throughout uh, these last eight days. In the face of disappointments and discouragements, you've conducted yourselves nobly. And after two minutes... I just want to say, God bless you both. We're glad you're back. We shall be everlastingly proud of you, and we are so thankful for all the blessings that are ours. Well, Gordon, I wish you could be out here with us this morning. Gordon, do you read me? Sir, Are you just reluctant, or did you not hear me? Pilot style. He finally closes the conversation with... Over and out. Time and flight, four minutes short of 191 hours, far exceeding cosmonaut Baikovsky's 119-hour record, which stood for two years and two months. Conrad and Cooper are found to be in excellent health, but could astronauts take it for 14 days? Our next test of man's adaptability in space. This is the concern and responsibility of Dr. Charles Berry, chief space physician at the Houston Center. Tapping on his desk for emphasis, he later outlines the problem as it then appeared. If you think about our flight program, we never really have repeated anything exactly the same ever yet. And therefore, you're always doing something new 
And there's always that element of, is this really going to go? Is this really going to work right? And this is uh, Gemini Control Houston. Paul Haney speaking. Carnarvon uh, should have acquired the spacecraft at 51 minutes and 7 seconds after the hour. Uh, we've had a running conversation with them over the last two minutes, and their report keeps coming back, no joy, no joy. That was October 25th, 1965. The day dawned radiant with ambition. On top of an atlas, a 26-foot Lockheed-built rocket called the Gina was to be fired into orbit. Ninety minutes later, Gemini 6 was to have launched, chase a Gina in space, and couple onto it, nose to nose. The mission has been scrubbed. We have scrubbed the mission for the day. Uh, because Carnarvon has not acquired, we can assume the Agena vehicle went into the Atlantic some 5,500 miles short of the desired velocity. The pursuers in this game of cosmic tag were to have been Wally Schirra and a freshman co-pilot, Air Force Major Tom Stafford, an almost egg-balled six-footer from Oklahoma. But instead of going into orbit, they come back to Earth by elevator. A $10 million flop. But minutes later, from disaster, a new idea is conceived, even more ambitious. The spacecraft for Gemini 7 and its Titan booster have already been delivered to the Cape, and its crew is well along in its training for a two-week mission. So why not try a double Gemini mission with two manned spacecraft rendezvousing in space? It will involve an immense task for the launch team to remove the GT-6 from the pad, replace it with the GT-7, launch GT-7, patch up the pad, ready it for GT-6, and launch GT-6 with its special radar equipment for rendezvous. The name of this game is Turnaround. December 4th, 40 days after the Agena bust-up, the big chase is launched. Gemini 7 goes first, manned by two rookies. Command pilot is Air Force Major Frank Borman, Hoosier-born but raised in the Arizona outdoors. A West Pointer, he once taught advanced physics at the academy. A lot of fun trying to stow the uh, spacecraft. It's about as large as the front seat of a Volkswagen. The glove compartments on the Gemini were located behind the seat. and They're extremely difficult to uh, get to, and they also were packed jammed tight, full of food. And I remember when... Uh, the plan was to use uh, Jim's food first and then uh, the one out of my glove compartment. And when I reached around to, to get the packaged food out, it took me about 15 minutes. And we were concerned for a while that the last seven days was going to be pretty hungry because it was really stuck in there. Co-pilot is Lieutenant Commander James Lovell, born in Ohio, raised in Wisconsin. He shares several traits with Frank Borman. Both are blonde, both are blue-eyed, both married their high school sweethearts. We started a new era in, in clothing. It's the first time we uh, took off our suits. Before that, the uh, image of a person in space would always have a big pressure suit on, you know, and you'd be all buttoned up with a visor down. So uh, going around, floating around in your lawn johns was sort of strange at first because uh, you, uh, you were not following the image of the people you were supposed to follow. December 12th, on their eighth day in orbit, as Borman and Lovell pass over the Cape, the pursuit team of Sharon Stafford are about to launch. You are cleared for takeoff. Roger, scramble one. All right, here, adios. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Ignition sparks. The engines rumble. In the cockpit, all lights are green. Suddenly. We have a shutdown, Jimmy Six. No, no liftoff. Verify program reset. No liftoff. Liftoff has failed. Should the crew eject or stay put? In a split second, they decide it's safer to stay put. A wise and courageous decision, as it turns out. But the fact remains that once again, a small mechanical defect has aborted an ambitious project. There will be more defects. Three days later, the twice earthbound team of Sharon Stafford finally take wing, heading toward Gemini 7, now circling 188 miles above the Cape. But at the start of the chase, the leaders are almost 1,400 miles ahead. It will take almost six hours, four revolutions, and dazzling maneuvers by Sharon Stafford to bring the pursuers in sight of their target. 
76, you are go. Go, you hear the man, go. The maneuvers are plotted by the onboard computer and verified down below in Houston. But it takes a man to carry them out. Okay, I'll push the button. It's only eight tenths. I don't want it to build on us. I'll push it at zero three, which will give us another ten seconds. Okay. Now, over the Atlantic, 235 miles behind and 17 miles below, Gemini 6's radar catches signals from Gemini 7. It will be a night meeting over the Western Pacific, so the Gemini 7's blinking lights will offer a clearer target. And now, finally... They are now just one foot apart, the first rendezvous in space. Wally Shira takes a moment for some cosmic fun. He stares through the windows of his neighbors and remarks, you guys sure have big beards. Big beards and all. For five orbits, some seven hours, the two teams continue flying in formation, each astronaut taking his turn at the controls. Then, mindful that Santa Claus is due in nine days, Tom Stafford makes a solemn report. This is Gemini 6. Uh, we have an object, looks like a satellite, uh, going from north to south, probably in a polar orbit. Uh, he's at a very low trajectory, traveling from north to south, and has a very high finest ratio. Looks like a might even be... There are those at Gemini Control who, for a moment, are convinced that Tom is describing an unidentified flying object, until... Shira on harmonica and Stafford on sleigh bells make it all clear. Two hours later, as in the hit song, Shira and Stafford are going back to Houston. Borman and Lovell remain two days longer in space, testing the new spacesuit and also working in long jumps. When they emerge finally from their capsule to stand on the deck of the carrier wasp, they've been 14 days without taking a bath or stretching their legs. But they've set a dazzling record as the most traveled men in history, more than five million miles, enough for 10 round trips to the moon. And three years later, they will make one of those round trips. February 28, 1966. Project Gemini is suddenly stilled and darkened by grief. Pilots Elliot C. and Charles Bassett, new appointees, die when their plane crashes in fog at St. Louis. It is a tragedy touched with irony. Their jet trainer hits the roof of the building which contains the capsule for the upcoming Gemini 9 mission they were to fly. The space program absorbs its casualties like an army in battle and moves on. Dr. Goddard was a great prophet, a true prophet. March 16th, President Johnson speaking to the National Space Club. To some it seems almost incredible that a year before Lindbergh had ever flown the Atlantic, he was dreaming and working to take us up in the stars. That same day, almost 200 miles in space, Neil Armstrong turns to his right and tells Dave Scott. Man, Dave, it's Neil. Is it really? The team of Gemini 8 manages to locate an Agena in the vast sea of space. A fish like the one that got away from Shara and Stafford five months ago by blowing itself up. Their mission, the first docking of two space vehicles. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, how are you doing? 
Station keeping at about 150 feet. Command pilot is Neil Armstrong, a former Navy pilot from the second group of astronauts who has flown the X-15 rocket plane 40 miles up at 3,818 miles an hour. Well, another thing that uh, we had been thoroughly briefed on before flight was the amount of time it takes in orbit to perform those normal functions which are uh, usually pretty simple on the ground. And we'd trained for many hours in a simulator and gone through all our procedures numbers of times. But when we got up in orbit, actually, and proceeded to go th through the mission as planned, we found that we were constantly uh, having to press to keep up with the flight plan. Neil's teammate is Air Force pilot David R. Scott of Texas, yet another generation of astronaut from the third group who has won three academic degrees. Gemini 8 is closed in to about two feet from Agena's target docking adapter, or TDA. Armstrong talks with the flight controller below in the South Atlantic on the Rose Knot Victor tracking ship. Okay, Gemini 8, you're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and uh, flight, we are docking. And he's really a smoothie. Oh, Roger. Hey, congratulations. This is real good. Six hours and 34 minutes after launch, Gemini 8 is locked to Agena in a bond that goes on for 27 minutes. Then suddenly, 185 miles over the Indian Ocean, after turning sideways, TV networks break in on popular entertainment programs to bring the running report from Gemini Control. There are fanatical lovers of adventure series like Batman and Lost in Space who protest bitterly at being interrupted by this life and death reality. Did he say he could not turn the Agena off? Say again? The gate is split and blowing them, but they can't seem to stop it or get them working. Did I hear a stuck hand controller? They undock, but still their spacecraft keeps rolling. There is a remedy to fire the thrusters that are only used to stabilize the craft during re entry. Under the rules, the mission must be terminated once the system is activated. It means making an emergency landing in a secondary recovery area in the Pacific west of Okinawa. Uh, Gemini 8, I have some uh, new rescue data for you. You ready to copy? It means the recovery ships and planes will have to race to the new impact point. And it means that Armstrong and Scott, with help from the tiny onboard computer, will have to steer their own way home. One and a half hours later in Houston, Eugene Kranz, the flight director of the second shift, gives the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one, retrofire. In a marvel of skill and precision, the disappointed astronauts splash down in the Pacific. Within minutes, frogmen drop from a plane, bringing rafts and a flotation collar, keeping all hands safe until the pickup by the destroyer Mason. Even more frustrating, the so-called alligator is whizzing through space almost 130 miles above the Pacific on this lovely third day of June, 1966. Hawaii, Capcom, Houston flight. Go flight. Roger, ask the crew if they could be set up. The wing information keeps there quite a while, and also had a suggestion that we might put out our docking bar and go up and tap it. In fact, what Tom Stafford is talking about is a substitute target for the troublesome Agena. But this one has no motor. It's been put together from stock bits and pieces. And the docking area of this spacecraft has been enclosed in what is called a shroud. Put into orbit by an Atlas booster, it has been followed into space two days later by the team of Gemini 9A with the idea of docking with it. Command pilot this time is Tom Stafford, who won his astronaut wings as second man to Wally Schirra during the big chase a couple of flights ago. We had a full moon, and suddenly it looked rather odd to us. And we came up to a position of approximately 1,000 feet. We could see this whole shroud out in reflected moonlight. Co-pilot is Gene Cernan, Chicago-born, a Navy flyer with two engineering degrees. And not only could we see the, the bright colored white painted shroud in reflected sunlight, but actually after dark, we could see the shroud in reflected moonlight. Their mission, Gemini Flight 9A, 
the place is Flight 9 that death has scrubbed. It's the first time the NASA's had to call on backup pilots. It will not be the last. I've got a counter-proposal. Ask them, uh, tell them we're going to continue working on their description and we'll cycle the adapter and uh, we'll pick them up over the space here. The trouble just now is that the shroud has failed to open and drop off, giving the bizarre appearance of wide-open alligator jaws. Docking, therefore, is impossible. Instead, Tom and Gene make use of the angry alligator as the target for a series of advanced rendezvous maneuvers one of which simulates a meeting with a lunar module 10 miles above the moon. Toward dawn of the third day, camera in hand, Gene steps out into space, moves himself along the surface of the spacecraft by handrails, and finds it unexpectedly hard labor in this vacuum, where everything he works with tries to float away. Ah, oh, the uh, handrail in the back is out. So bad that I may be able to get this one. Okay, come on there, you turn. Gene's faceplate clouds over, and there are technical difficulties. With night rushing on, Gene goes back to the adapter section of the spacecraft for a much needed rest. Now, as he meets another day over Africa, Gene moves out again along the skin of Gemini to a locker containing a Buck Rogers backpack. Purpose? to enable him to cut loose from the umbilical and fly about under his own power. As he starts plugging in the electrical circuits... Okay, he says he's getting extreme fogging on his visor and trying to freeze up. And also that uh, he was having quite a bit of trouble reading it. The, the pilot was uh, fairly garbled. It turns out that working in weightlessness is like pushing boulders. For a moment, Gene rests. His visor clears enough for him to glance earthward and joke. As Gene climbs back in, his precious film floats out of his hand. He stares. Too exhausted by his two hours and seven minutes of walking in space to even reach. On the way home, Command Pilot Stafford skillfully maneuvers to a splashdown in the Atlantic that is only two miles off target. It was an ambitious flight plan. I've always thought that the probability, statistically speaking, of doing everything that we had in the mission was very low. But on the 18th of July, the boosters, the Agena, the Gemini, the launch crews, the flight operations division, and even the one thing we couldn't do anything about, the weather, was on our side. That's veteran John Young, looking back fondly as command pilot on GT-10. It took place between the 18th and 21st of July, 1966. A month that down on Earth becomes the most tragic of our longest and hottest summers yet. Riots scorched the land in seven cities between California and Florida. We had two rendezvous. The, the first one, of course, was with our own Agena, Agena 10. And it was the one where we uh, used more gas than we expected. So uh, we were happy to get there, but we weren't uh, exactly exuberant because we knew that uh, we'd paid quite a price in, in getting there and that this would uh, somewhat hamper what we wanted to do during the uh, remainder of the mission. The pilot is Air Force Major Mike Collins an Irish-American, West Point graduate, who happened to be born in Rome, Italy. No, Roger, I know we can see the target out the window now. Uh, very good. That's John Young. After giving a Gina 10 a head start, he and Collins chase it for 103,000 miles in space, close in, and dock. This is Gemini Control Houston. We're five hours, 59 minutes into the flight. At five hours, 58 minutes, the flight controller Ed Fendel at Hawaii reported that the two are docked. They are docked. Yeah, we've had no voice contact with the crew as yet. However, they're reading out good telemetry on the ground at Hawaii. Now comes an order that, for the first time, will turn a Gina 10 into a real workhorse, the kind of maneuver needed to bring our team back from the moon. SPS 
initiate. When that baby light, there's no doubt about it. As John Young will later describe the spectacular new happening in a universe growing used to sensations. Mike threw the switch, and a minute and 24 seconds later, boy, it was really something. Uh, we had a negative 1G, and we were driven forward in the cockpit, and for 11 seconds, we got a tremendous thrill on our way to Apogee and to a new world's altitude record. Twice more, Mike commands the main engine of Agena to burn and shoot them into an orbit 476 miles above the Earth in preparation for the next major goal of the flight. For 39 hours, all the more sensational for being so peaceful, Gemini 10 and Agena 10 circle the Earth in coupled flight. Mike, standing up with a hatch open, takes special photos of the southern constellation. What's it like at 18,000 miles per hour? During the stand at BBA, it's almost like uh, standing with your, with your head up through the, uh, through the roof of a car going, going sideways across the world. It, uh, it, was a very, it was a very pleasant sensation. Then finally, after he's back inside, Gemini 10 uses a Gina 10's secondary engines to be pushed more than halfway back toward Earth. Okay, thank you. And now Gemini 10 separates to go on a hunt. Its objective? None other than Agena 8, which has been whirling in orbit for 126 days since its brief alarming tumble while docked with the Gemini 8 spacecraft of Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott. The search succeeds in only three hours and without benefit of radar. Gemini 10, Houston. See anything of the Agena 8 around? Well, we're about, uh, I guess, uh, Fantastic, John. Yeah, I don't believe it myself. What's in mind here is more than the mere feat of a rendezvous. Mike Collins will try to retrieve from the inactive Agena 8 a meteoroid detection box, a device that all along has been recording the impact of bits of space shrapnel. Good luck, Mike. Off system, Okay, uh, Houston, this is Gemini 10. Uh, everything outside is... I had a lot of things to do, and I had a very short time to do them in. And it was going to be busy, and we purposely had uh, had made it busy because we thought there were many worthwhile things to be done. So I threw the hatch, threw the hatch open, and uh, rattled on back, and plugged in a connector, and used my uh, my gun, my uh, jet propelled gun, to zip on over to the Agena, and I fell off the Agena, and I zipped back to the Gemini, and went over the Agena again, and got this experiment, and came on back, and. We ran short on fuel, and I got back in and closed the door. And all these things were uh, were done very rapidly. They were do they were done as fast as I could do them. But to sum it up, I was happy to be out of the confined space of the of the small Gemini cockpit. I I was aware that it was a fantastic situation to be in. I mean, there you are out there floating around with a world going by and uh, two spacecraft in close proximity to you. And I wish that I'd had time just to relax and enjoy it. Again, the physical effort is found to be considerable. A $500 camera slips from Mike's tired hand and floats away into the universe, like Ed White's glove on the spacewalk of Gemini 4. I'll uh, see you next time around. We sure haven't done work with you. Thank you very much. Enjoy it down here also. Good evening, Jeff. Got us out of a tense situation into a pre in there toward the end. Okay, fine. Thank you. Getting ready for re-entry, Gemini 10 dumps the umbilical cord and other unwanted yeah, items adding to some 1,200 bits of trash which are now cluttering space, including satellites and burned-out rockets, a possible traffic hazard someday on commuter roads between Earth and Moon. That's Pete Conrad calling 20 feet across space to third-generation astronaut Lieutenant Commander Dick Gordon, father of six children, who's sitting astride a Gina 11 riding a ten million dollar horse over the empty plains of heaven. How did he do it? I decided that I would sit on the spacecraft and wedge my legs in between the TDA, the target docking adapter, and the spacecraft so that I could have the luxury of using both hands. But I was unable to actually sit on the spacecraft in the manner I had done in the Zero-G airplane. I kept riding up off of it so all I could use was my feet. And this was a very tiring operation in itself, and then I had to use my feet wedged between the spacecraft and the TDA to hold myself in place. Launches are now proceeding at an average of one every two months. Of the original seven, 
only Wally Schirra, Gus Grissom, and Gordo Cooper are still on the active list. Al Shepard, our first man in space, has been grounded by an inner ear infection and now works with Deke Slayton, supervising the enlarged astronaut pool. John Glenn, also suffering ear trouble from a bathroom fall, has retired to private industry. Scott Carpenter is now working in the ocean depths for the Navy. Uh, we're looking straight down over Australia now. We have the Terminator at our right window. We have the whole northern part of the uh, world uh, out one window. Utterly fantastic. Pete Conrad talking. Between September 12th and 15th, Gemini 11 scores dazzling achievements under his command. Pete, who previously co-piloted Gemini 5 in a storm of shrimp and sang most of the way home, now has as his co-pilot Dick Gordon, the first man to cross America in less than three hours. These two young men in a hurry are making new speed history. On the very first orbit, within 94 minutes of liftoff, Pete and Dick catch their Agena. They manage this in spite of difficulty with the Agena radar by using instead Dick's slide rule computations and the onboard computer. This is a kind of space marksmanship considered imperative for manned moon flight. The following day, leaving the spacecraft, Dick moves over to Agena, pulls from it a golden 100-foot cord and ties it to the nose of Gemini 11. Gently linked, the two craft drift lazily in orbit with engines shut off, thus sparing fuel vital for maneuvering. This is an experimental step toward the ultimate building of space stations. 11, you're go for the burn. Fire. That's ready. On the second day, docked again, Pete burns Agena's main engine with its eight-ton thrust. This yanks him to a point 850 miles above the Earth, the furthest out from Earth that man has ever gone. I'll tell you, you can't believe it. Just out of my left window, I, I can see all the way to the PDF, around the top of the world, all the way around about 150 degrees, including the horizon all the way around. Reentry is another feat with a purpose. So appreciate help from everybody down there and uh I'll show you a great for seven hundred and fifty miles. Within fifty miles of Earth, the pilots remove their hands from the controls, and the onboard computer takes over. In a marvel of accuracy, the computer lands Gemini eleven in the Atlantic one and a half miles from Bullseye. Now only one major problem seems to remain the extreme exhaustion caused by working in space outside the cabin. And within two months, in the final manned Gemini flight, that too will be solved. Okay, I'm free now. The only thing that's holding me is uh, one hand on the handrail. Meet Air Force Major Buzz Aldrin as he works and walks in space. Sometimes, 
he moves like a window washer along the outside surfaces of Gemini 12. At other times, like a fly on a ceiling. With a lot of ingenious new equipment to help him, he works almost a full union day outside the cabin, five and a half hours, virtually without sweat. Our launch day on November 11th, I have an emblem here that I'd like to leave in orbit. It says November 11th, Vets Day. Roger, I'd like to extend the meaning of it to uh, include all the people of the world who have, have been and are now and will continue to strive for peace and freedom in the world. Fine. Okay, Ed White, you're doing a good job. Now, wait a minute, I've got another one here. Now, this message that I have uh, concerns a contest coming up in the future. And I think the precedent was set for this about a year ago. And I'm not sure that Jim can read this one, so I'll read it out loud to you so you all can hear. Go Army, beat Navy! Buzz Aldrin, appointed with the third group, represents the new breed in space, the Fighting Highbrow. He flew 66 combat missions in Korea and also earned a Ph.D. at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His command pilot on Gemini 12 is Jim Lovell who earned the nickname of Shaky during the two-week mission of Gemini 7. Well, I think the uh, Gemini uh, spacecraft is uh, well adapted to look into the problems of EVA. Certainly, EVA and Rendezvous are the two most important areas of our training and our learning for the Apollo program. Uh, we're going to go EVA and Apollo, of course, so we must learn as much as possible in Gemini. Extravehicular activity with a heavy workload is the main purpose of this mission taking place between November 11th and 15th, 1966. For weeks before, to cope with problems of fatigue, Aldrin practiced in a water tank every move he'd make in space. The outer skins of both Gemini and Agena have been fitted with handrails to make things easier. A pair of footholds called golden slippers have been welded into the rear section. And like a window washer, he wears straps that he hooks onto the spacecraft at strategic points. At times, he hauls himself about with two portable adhesive handrails, resembling a housefly walking on a ceiling. Thus equipped, he proves that man can work productively in space. At the conference which winds up the Gemini program, the statistics all bespeak fabulous success. In 20 months, at a cost of a billion and a third dollars, we launched 10 manned Gemini missions. While we sent up 20 spacemen, the Russians sent up only two dogs. Between Mercury and Gemini, we've now logged 1,993 man hours in space, compared with 507 for the Russians. Jim Lovell, with his two Gemini missions, has become the most traveled man in history. Seven and a third million miles, enough for 15 round trips to the moon. George M. Lowe, deputy director of the Manned Spacecraft Center, sums it up. Gentlemen, we have ended one of the most successful programs in our short history of spaceflight. As you have seen, the Gemini achievements have been many. They included such things as long duration flight, maneuvers in space, rendezvous, docking, the use of large propulsion systems in space, working outside the spacecraft, controlled re-entry, and of course a host of medical, technological, and scientific experiments. Gentlemen, the Gemini program is now officially completed. There is one more statistic of great profundity. In the nine years since the first Sputnik went bleating across the sky and announced the space age, some 40 million Americans have been born. A fifth of our population knows none but the space age. They've come into being at a time when, once again, the area of our known world is about to be vastly enlarged, as by Columbus in 1492. The words of John Kennedy echo in our ears. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic. We choose to go to the moon.
we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. On to the moon. Project Apollo in preparation since 1961, now goes into full swing. We foresee no great obstacles. 16 times we sent men into space and brought them back unharmed. We've met every problem and solved it. So what is there to worry about? Nothing. No more than Achilles had to worry about. Achilles, whose body the gods had made immune to wounds, except in one little spot at the back of one heel. As with Achilles, an arrow will find its way to a fatal spot in Apollo.